Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today, we have a This Is Not A Top 10 on one of my favorite notes in perfumery. Uh, it's an animalic note, and this is a very special video. If I look hot and sweaty, it's because I just got back from a uh, three mile run, and um, my Raiders won. Uh, and so, even though we've lost twice as many games as we've won this year so far, uh, I'm still happy for a win, so I'm in a damn good mood. And I said, you know what? I've been wanting to do this video. I rank them weeks ago. I've had the ranking all done. It's just a matter of getting the time to do it. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm chipper. You know, I'm in a good mood today. So let's let's do this. This is going to be on the note of civet, okay? And civet is, if you guys don't know, it's basically an animal, a mammal, that lives in mostly Asia and Africa. And they kind of look like... Um, Maybe like uh, small, you know, mixtures of like a raccoon and a cat. You know, it's kind of a strange animal. Uh, and the reason that they're so important to perfume is that they have this uh, gland called a uh, perennial gland. And the perennial gland is this uh, very uh, animalic, strong, pissy, smell that is very highly valued in fragrance, in perfume, in the art of perfumery. Uh, it adds a touch of uh, the wild side to a fragrance. It, it adds a little bit of funk. It adds a little bit of mysteriousness. And, you know, to be quite frank, one, one of my favorite answers why animalics have ever been used in perfumery was given by Roja Dove, who I know I give him a lot of shit, and rightly so, okay, for some of his tactics and strategies and all that stuff, but you can't deny the fact that the man loves perfume. And uh, no matter what you think of his marketing tactics and the prices he sells these bottles for, you have to give it to uh, the fact that you can tell in his heart he loves perfume. Now, I wish he was a little bit more uh, open and less political. Everything he says is like a politician's answer. He tells the same story over and over and over and over again, right? And I've talked about this before, but one time he did a Q&A. A couple times he's done a Q&A, but you can tell the questions are pre-screened. He actually read one of my questions once. You can go watch it. Uh, and I did a follow-up down below and we got into a little bit of an argument and then I just kind of left it alone because it wasn't worth it. Uh, but uh, it was actually about whether he was the perfumer or not, believe it or not. But you, if you go to his Q&A videos and look at the comments, I don't know if they scrubbed it or not, but uh, if it's still there, you'll be able to kind of see our back and forth. Uh, and long story short, is somebody asked him on one of those Q&A videos during the pandemic when he was just like hanging out in his backyard. <laughs> they said, why do perfumers use these notes that smell pissy or fecal or animalic? And he said, well, uh, to be quite frank, uh, the anus is right next to the genitals. That was the answer that he gave. And he said, as a human, when you when you smell something animalic, even if it's fecal, or you know, indolic ind indoles from jasmine, for example, can come across as fecal smelling to some people. So there's many different ways perfumers can get this pissy animalic fecal vibe. Okay, and many of the fragrances are supposed to kind of have a hidden piece of of the animalic pie. Many times you're not supposed to out and out smell civet or hyrax or skunk or castorium or, you know, whatever it is, um, ambergris or, you know, many, many of those animalic notes are supposed to be kind of hidden, subconscious, right? Kind of making you think of sex or, you know, think of being intimate with somebody else, right? That's kind of the, the perfumer's job is to hide stuff underneath the surface is the is the answer Roja gave. And I thought that was a very intelligent answer. It was very blunt, okay? And he's been blunt before. I heard him say stuff like a flower doesn't have a penis or a vagina, right? Uh, so he has been blunt before with his descriptors of animalics, but you know what? He's he's spot on. I think there's some truth to that. There's a lot of our brain that we don't really uh, consciously use, many people uh, use less of their brain than others, but um, there's a, a large portion of our brain that's kind of on autopilot. And when you smell something like that, you may have a association or you may have a reaction internally and maybe not even realize the reason why you're having that reaction. And so uh, that's kind of uh, an interesting little intro into 
the civet, and I have luckily, thanks to my good friend Russian Adam, smelled both. I've smelled synthetic civet, I've smelled real civet. I have some perfumes here that use synthetic civet, and I like, I actually like synthetic civet. I don't hate it. I've heard some people say that it's so rough, it's so animalic. The one that was really rough and animalic and tough for me was the 100% pure skunk oil. That stuff is wow. I mean, go watch my video with Russian Adam where we broke down each 50 ingredient list together. We went through and smelled them and talked about them. Fantastic stream. Uh, and I also taught, did a video on them myself, so you can go watch both. Uh, but, um, civet, synthetic civet, I like in a fragrance, actually, I don't hate it, uh, but many of the brands by the late 80s or to mid 90s, I think Chanel basically claims that number five, um, has been, re natural civet has been replaced with synthetic civet substitutes since the late 90s, for example, so many of the brands in that time frame, from the late 80s to the late 90s, or even the mid 80s to the late 90s, switched to synthetic civet, uh, partially because of costs, and partially because ethical concerns began to arise. The way that the uh, civet um, secretion, for lack of a better word, is uh, taken off the animal, is they um, have this secretion whenever they're either uh, I think, aroused or whenever they are in fear for their life. And so what these people that keep these civets will do is they'll keep them in a small little cage and they'll just go bang the cage. I mean, just like thinking the, the civet uh, toddy cat or whatever you want to call it, uh, the civet cat, for lack of a better word, I don't know what they're actually called, um, the civet cat is is basically, you know, constantly in this uh, state of emotional distress because the people that have them want to, um, you know, make you get as much bang for their buck, if you will, because they view them like an investment, right? And so their quality of life is very poor. Uh, and I mean, sometimes they'll just kill it. They'll just kill the cat, take the secretion and leave. And so because now the world animal protection rights and all that stuff has really popped up, uh, more and more synthetic civet is being used. And since I've smelled both, I can tell you that uh, synthetic civet is good. But man, some of these, I'll show you a couple older bottles that I have, and I'll show you some fragrances that use real civet, and it is really a beautiful thing to smell. Uh, I know some people have uh, ethical concerns when buying some of these fragrance houses that use real civet. Um, you know, and so that's, everyone has to make their own choice of that. The last thing is that there are some coffees that actually will use uh, civet in some form. You can kind of look up the relationship between some coffees and uh, civet. And some of the very high-end coffees, in fact, they can sell for uh, $600 in some parts of the world. $100 a cup, that kind of stuff, you know, for this special type of um, civet, uh, you know, coffee blend of some sort. Uh, so I'm not as into that game. I'm into the perfume side of things, but let's get started. So you guys know animalics are one of my favorite notes, and this is going to be, this video is going to be a top 50, is what I'm going to call it, a top 50 countdown ranked of my favorite civet uh, fragrances with, I was going to do 10 honorary mentions, but I'm going to do 11 honorary mentions. I know it sounds weird, so 10 plus 1, you can call it honorary mentions. And these 10 are not ranked, because I don't really have experience with them enough to rank them. I've never worn, I've either never worn them uh, in full, I've never given them a full wear, or, you know, if I have, I just can't decipher the civet note, because I'm ranking the quality and the intensity and, you know, the percentage of the fragrance where the civet note plays a big role, right? And so I'm not ranking my favorite fragrance. I'm ranking the civet note inside of the fragrances, which is a very tough exercise to do. Sometimes it's really hard to pick out the civet from the rest of the perfume, right? So let's get started. Number 61, if you will, or the plus one on the 10 honorary mentions is Akitos. Now, Akitos is created by... Uh, one of my favorite perfumers of all time, and that is um, that is a gentleman named Gerard Anthony, okay? 
And the reason that this is here, I have worn this multiple times, I know the fragrance, but sometimes I get a civet uh, note from this, and sometimes I get no civet note. Sometimes it seems so present and in your face, and sometimes it is just completely um, missing from the fragrance when I wear it. It's a really strange shape shifter of a fragrance. Sometimes it feels spicy, sometimes it feels woody, Sometimes it feels leathery. Sometimes it feels floral. I mean, it's a it's a very complex perfume. And um, I don't think it would be fair to rank this because you may wear this and go, where where is the civet? I have no clue where it's at. And someone else may smell it and go, holy Jesus, that is animalic and challenging. And so I put it here because I just really don't know where else to put it. So I just put it in the honorary mentions, okay? So Alain Delon, Aquitos, but this is a hidden gem now. Um, this was almost the fragrance that became Dior's Poison, the big hit for women from the 80s. And if you smell this thinking that it went for the Poison Brief, uh, it will make a lot of sense to you. And, you know, this is an interesting one because it was originally meant to be a feminine fragrance and then marketing turned it into a masculine. Now men, you know, across the world wear it and love it and all that stuff. And this is one of the best examples of how Perfume has no gender. Going back to Roja Dove's, um, you know, comment about a flower. Uh, so anyways, Akitos is number uh, 61. All right, number 60. And again, these are unranked. This I've never even smelled yet. I've been very lucky to get this little bit of juice from my good friend, Will. Thank you, Will, uh, for sending me these. You've now sent me multiple little decants to sniff. I have so much content to do because of people like you. I very, very much appreciate it. And this is the fame, the class. I'd love a bottle of this one day. This is the great Cotis, Francois Cotis original chiffre. Uh, I just knocked my camera off my, uh, not, not the camera for that we're filming this on my phone, but my camera like for, um, uh, for official business, let's say, just straight off of the computer. I hope it's okay. I'll check it later. But uh, Cote's Chifra is like the quintessential Chifra fragrance. It was created in 1917. And interestingly enough, you usually will find Civet as a base note, right? Here, it's Bergamot, Sage, and Civet in the top. And so, uh, Orris Root, Jasmine, and Rose uh, in the heart, and Oak Moss and Labdanum in the base. And um, this is, for a Chifra lover like me, this is really something I'd love to get a bottle of one day. Uh, if I could trade for it like Will did and get a good deal, I would totally do it. But um, I just refuse to pay six or $800 for a bottle. I just can't. But I can tell you that uh, even from the atomizer, I can tell that I'm going to absolutely love this and I can't wait to do a video on it. Uh, I Speaking of iconic fragrances, I did a video on um, uh, Guerlain's Apres Londe yesterday. Go check that out if, you, if you're into those iconic, you know, Hallmark Hall of Fame fragrances. Uh, that was an amazing fragrance to smell. Okay, next we're going to go to number uh, 59, if you will, or just we're still on the honorary mentions. But uh, this is a Centauri perfume, so Peter Carter's house, and I'm very interested to sniff this one. And uh, this is basically called Om. Centauri Om. That's what it looks like right there. Like Om. Uh, that's what I think anyways, when I think of Om. And um, yeah, that's Om. And so there's the, the note breakdown. And you can see that uh, synthetic civet is what he lists. And he was very specific to list synthetic civet because I know there were some people that were, you know, uh, very offended by using, you know, real animal parts. Some people even gave him a hard time for using ambergris, real ambergris, which shows just how little they understand um, how ambergris is you know, found and used and stuff like that. Uh, they're not out there killing the whales. They're just finding the ambergrises on the beach. Uh, but you're, you're always going to get that group of crazies, I think, when you do anything in the world nowadays. And they are uh, completely irrational. Like, you cannot reason with some of these people. Uh, even if you, you know, show them, tell them, explain to them exactly how it works, they're still just, you know, there's just a percentage of the population today that's just 
Bah. But um, Centauri's Ulm is uh, one that I'm very excited to try. It's supposed to be this green, smoky fragrance. I love smoky fragrances. I love the story behind this one, and it has a you know synthetic civet, civet note and deer musk uh, and real Irish white ambergris, which is a rarity. So, um, needless to say, I am very excited about that. Okay, honorary mention number, what is this, four. This is going to be from the House of Bagwe, and this is called Mem. Now, I've talked about this fragrance on my channel a lot, but I never say much about it because, honestly, it's one of the most uh, challenging fragrances, I think, for me to dissect. It's extremely complex. There's a ton of lavender in there. And there's these very specific notes that you would think I would really like, like there's jasmine grandiflorum, Himalayan cedar, Indian sandalwood, uh, white champaca, you know, all of this, uh, elang, lily of the valley, damask rose, bourbon geranium, um, castorium. This has both castorium and civet, but I, I really have a hard time with this one. I've said before, it feels like the animalics are like emanating from the flowers, like the flowers are like sweating uh, animalics, if that makes sense. It, it makes no sense, but that's um, kind of the vibe that it gives me. And then that lavender is huge. Uh, the florals are big, and so I need to wear it again. But uh, man, I, I struggle with it. Actually, I struggle with all of Antonio Gardoni's work. So that's why it's in the honorary mention, because I just can't rank how the civet works. Okay. Uh, next is going to be two Spirit of Dubai fragrances, and again, I can't rank these because they have this, they have this synthetic Middle East style to them. Um, so the first one is uh, Fahama, the black one, and the second one is a fragrance called Tarath, all right, and um, Tarath is the blue one, and I've done full videos on both of these. You can go check these out. I kind of, I ripped the bow on Fakama so it doesn't look as good, but that's how they're supposed to look, or I guess like that. But um, yes, I mean, they they are good perfumes. Fakama was this uh, rose with lots of fruity notes like blackcurrant and strawberry and coconut and stuff like that, uh, and coffee, but there is a uh, civet note in the base. And, um, uh, Fakama, I'm sorry, that was, uh, Tarath. Fakama is the rose one with coffee and dried fruits and, and cipriol and stuff like that with castorium and civet in the base. And it was, uh, Tarath with the, uh, pineapple and apple, strawberry, blackcurrant. And then they, I think both have a, an oud saffron thing going on. This Middle East Accord makes it very hard for me to, um, place the civet, if you will. I think it's just there to kind of give a touch of, uh, you know, a touch of texture and distinction and a little bit of chat, a little, try to challenge you a little more. Uh, but those heavy amber woods that Spirit of Dubai uses, uh, almost like, it's like they smother everything. You know what I mean? You know how if you have a fire going, you need to have, the fire needs air. It's like if you just take this cloth and just like smother the fire, you know, it has no opportunity to, to grow. And uh, that's what the amber woods in those Spirit of Dubai's feel like. They may use fantastic notes, but they're just smothered. Okay, next, it's going to be a Dior. And the reason that this is here is I've never given this a full wear, although I should because it's such an iconic fragrance. Uh, so at 55, uh, and again, th these honorary mentions are not ranked, but this is uh, Diorissimo, the great Edmund Rudnitska is one of the greatest, probably the greatest li lily of the valley scent of all time. Um, and we've talked about it before, you know, the scent of lily of the valley cannot be extracted. I did an entire lily of the valley episode. This is not a top 10. You can go check that out. But um, this is this beautiful floral lilac and jasmine and elang and lily, lily of the valley with a base of sandalwood and civet. But the sandalwood and civet is very moderated. You know, it's extremely reserved. This is a very beautiful perfume. It's a beautiful floral fragrance. I just, um, honestly, I don't know it well enough because it's not the type of fragrance I yearn to wear. Uh, but uh, it, it definitely deserves an honorary mention. Okay, another one that I have to wear very soon because 
I wore this to bed once. I haven't given it a full wear, so this is why this is here. I think this would actually be much higher on the list Have I had I had a chance to give it a full wear. Um, and I will try to do that very soon because this fragrance deserves to be talked about. I don't own any from this house except for this, and this is thanks to Rachel. So thank you again, Rachel. Uh, and this is from Clandestine Laboratories, and it's called Film Noir. And I have to tell you what, if this is the type of work that this gentleman does, I need to dive into this house more. This is very good. Extremely good stuff. Uh, for a little indie perfumer who kind of does it all himself. It's oud and vanilla and honey and iris, lavender, pimento, false sandalwood, tonka, Nepalese pepper, rose, vetiver, civet, and oak moss. And it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, the uh, vetiver and... Um, Pepper combo is stunning. The neroli adds a little bit of freshness. The honey adds this resinous quality. I love the iris. I mean, all of the notes just kind of play their part and you would think it wouldn't fit. And yet when I wore it to bed, it just felt like it all came together beautifully. So um, I have to wear this soon and talk about it because this deserves uh, a little spotlight on the channel. So again, thank you, Rachel. Thank you for allowing me to highlight this. Okay. Uh, another one that I just recently got in, and so that's why it's coming in at number 53, if you will, uh, but still just the honorary mentions, and it's a fragrance called, uh, from Ensar Oud, it's called E01 Assam Parfum, Pure Parfum. So apparently there's just an E01, and then there's E01 Assam, which is a different fragrance. This is the E01 Assam, and this is thanks to Nissan. So Nissan, thank you, my friend. Seriously. Uh, I will be doing videos on these and talking about them very soon. As you can see, I have a ton of samples to talk about. So if anybody sends me stuff, please be patient. Uh, I am very sporadic in how I talk about things. Sometimes I walk into a day and I have no clue what I'm going to wear or talk about that day. And it just kind of hits me. I grab something like when I did that early impression of that Armani uh, Ode in the Wheat, Oud, or whatever it was. I mean, that was like spur of the moment. I just grabbed it, sprayed it on at night, talked about it. Sometimes that's how it goes. So if you do send me stuff, please be patient. I promise you I will talk about it, whether that's tomorrow or eight months from tomorrow, but it will happen. Uh, so EO and Assam is very interesting to me. I can tell by the, just off of what's coming out of this little atomizer here, that it is an amazing fragrance. Um, Cypress and lavender, nutmeg and real ambergris, multiple types of rose, civet, tobacco, Assam oud, frankincense, my kind of fragrance, multiple types of frankincense. Um, man, this is something I can't wait to talk about, but I haven't worn it yet, so I can't really rank it. That wouldn't be fair. Uh, and another one I haven't worn yet, but I do have a bottle, uh, thanks to the great Anuj at Enchante Perfumes. Thank you, Anoush. Uh, and this is a 118 milliliter. What a strange bottle size. But this is the great uh, Parfums uh, Wheel, or Weil, which no one talks about. Uh, and this is called Zibline. So, uh, Zibline. There it is. Um, so you can see the old packaging. You can see the, this is actually a splash, I believe. Uh, um, there's the note listing. That's what a, that is what a note listing looks like, ladies and gentlemen. It should not be this long. Uh, it should not take up this. That is a note listing. You want a note listing? Yeah, sure. It's fragrance, okay? You got a problem with that? Good. That's how a note listing should be. Uh, and here's the bottle. Uh, and this one I have not given a full wear to yet, so I just figured it wouldn't be fair to rank it. Um, but it is an iconic fragrance from the 20s. Yes, from the 1920s. So this is, this came out around the same time as Shalimar and stuff like that. Um, and it's a, anim it's an animalic spicy fragrance with honey and aldehydes and coriander it has one of my favorite notes in the opening, tarragon. It's got tarragon, gardenia, iris, jasmine, lily of the, of the valley, rose, elang, amber, honey, musk. 
uh, amber honey, uh, musk, sandalwood, tonka bean, vetiver, and civet. And so, um, you know, very complex fragrance. And just from the wear to bed that I've done, I've never given it a full wear, but just from kind of like this quick right before bed, spray it on to get a feel for what it's like. Uh, it's very interesting, very interesting fragrance, very complex. But apparently this was reformulated and there's a new version uh, that is absolute shite. So they tried to put it out again in 2011, I think it was. Um, let me see if I can just tell you guys. Yeah, 2011, they tried to reissue it and the bottle kind of looks square. Uh, do not get that one. It's It looks like, um, what kind of bottle? It just looks like a square bottle. The cap you know, evenly matches up with the bottle and just makes a, an easy square, but uh, they completely changed it. That's now a floral sweet fragrance with stuff like sweet pea and uh, tonka and benzoin and prune, and so it's a totally different fragrance, it seems like, from the note listing. Okay, and then a couple more honorary mentions, I believe, and then we'll get to the actual countdown. So... Um, number 51 on, uh, so this is the final, uh, this is the final, um, honorary mention, and then we'll do our top 50, and this is called Dana's Taboo, and again, same reason, uh, I haven't given this a full wear yet, so I don't think it's fair to put it in the list, I have worn it to bed, but I have not had a chance to do a full wear, but if you like stuff like YSL Opium or Aramis JHL or Cinnabar, you know, those type of fragrances, you get the idea. Uh, this should be right up your alley. Taboo is very good, very underrated. The problem is it's been changed. You know, uh, Dana is kind of one of those zombie houses where they die, it comes back, it dies again, another investor revives it, and they reformulate and all this stuff. It is powdery and oriental, and the patchouli in this, by the way, when I wore it to bed, the patchouli was a little bit head shoppy, if that makes sense, head shop patchouli. Uh, but uh, if you can find the one that says Dana Perfume Corp, not New Dana, don't buy the one that says New Dana, but if you can buy the one that says Dana Perfume Go for it. That's that's the one that you want. Um, okay, so let's do the top 50. But before we do that, let's do my scent of the day. Uh, and my scent of the day, I tortured myself today. And I will do this from time to time. Like, I just want to wear my favorites. And yet, I also want to continue to put stuff in the rotation. And so I forced myself to wear this today because it has been two years since I wore this fragrance. Uh, and it is Le Labo's Santal 33. And you know what really uh, kind of ticked me off today when I was wearing this is there is a phase of this perfume, probably like the first hour to hour and a half, where it almost makes me want to irk. It makes me want to throw up. And I have no clue what that is. Maybe it's that synthetic sandalwood, that pickly Australian sandalwood. But there is this phase where after it kind of dries, it's, it's acceptable, you know. Uh, an hour and a half to two hours in, it starts to turn acceptable because it has this iris, I think, that, you know, contrast that just straight in-your-face synthetic sandalwood, scratchy, screechy, loud sandalwood, the exact opposite of smooth and creamy Mysore sandalwood, you know, uh, buttery Mysores over here. This is all the way on the other side of the spectrum, uh, but... Um, People love this stuff, and, and uh, I watch all of the football games with a friend. I've been doing it basically most of my life, and um, this, is a, this is a fragrance that is um, kind of hated in the perfume community, if you will. Many people hate on this fragrance, but um, whenever I went to go watch the game with my friend today, his wife is always interested in what I'm wearing, right? So uh, I go over today and she's like, what are you wearing today? And I was like, what do you think? And she's like, oh, this is my favorite fragrance you've ever worn. And I was like, oh, God. Uh, you know, it's like, um, 
And I think it's because the Ambroxan in this is so turned up. It's so loud. It's almost like a, um, it's almost like a precursor to, um, Ganymede or, you know, that very synthetic Akigala wood that Ganymede uses. The Ambrox and the Amber Woods or whatever you want to call it, whatever synthetic materials are in this are so loud and so turned up that people smell it and they're like, wow, I can really smell this easily, you know. But it's just like a, it's like a hammer to the head all day. Just bam, bam, bam. But, um, you know, and that's why I have a decant and not a full bottle. It's the only Lalabo that I have any juice of. Uh, I don't own any Lalabo full bottles, if that gives you any idea. So that was my scent of the day. All right, let's do the top 50. Number 50. Uh, number 50 comes in uh, as a Roja Dove, believe it or not. And it is... Chifra Extraordinaire. So I have a full video on this coming very soon. Uh, Chifra Extraordinaire is uh, one of my least favorite Roja fragrances. And it's not because it's a bad fragrance, because it is a good fragrance. It just doesn't do what I want as a Chifra. I want my Chifras to be more like Diaghilev. This is for people that don't like the big Baroque, as, as Roja calls it, Diaghilev. It's more about this aldehydic floral with light touches of fruit, peach and plum and stuff like that. And, and it is beautiful. You know, it has all of the Roja hallmarks. It's got the beautiful Cystus Labdanum and, you know, that patented Roja floral heart. And there is some dirtiness. There's cumin and stuff like that. Uh, and there's beautiful iris in the base. And there's leather, but I don't get very much leather. And there's civet in the base. And I don't get very much civet. And so I like it the other way. I like it big, heavy. You know, I like a lot of animalics, and this is kind of the opposite of that. But I think this would smell absolutely lovely on a executive, like a high, like a high power, a woman in a position of power. You know, this would smell stunning on on a woman like that. Uh, and um, but I will do a full review on Chifra Extraordinaire. So that's number fifty. All right, number forty nine. Number forty nine is going to be Marlou's Carnicure. And this just edges out uh, Chifra Extraordinaire because the Chif the um, Cibet note in here is just a little bit more to me. However, uh, I think I would take Chifra Extraordinaire over this fragrance if I was just picking my favorites to wear. But as far as ranking the Cibet note, this gets the nudge at number 49. And you know what? If you like stuff like Kiel's Original Musk, if you like stuff like Serge Luton's Musk's Kublai Khan, which will be on this list later on, this is like an animalic floral version of Musk Kublai Khan that's a little easier to wear, okay? It has orange blossom, violet, sandalwood, patchouli, civet, and musk. And um, it's like an easier to wear Musk Kublai Khan. It's good, but if I had a chance to do it all over again, I probably would not buy a bottle of this um, just because the more I've kind of worn it, I wear it to bed every now and then. And I'm always like, mm. I mean, I have a little bit of Musk Kublai Khan that I also never wear because that kind of challenges me. I had a uh, ex who actually wore that, believe it or not. And um, so I have these strange memories attached to Musk's Kublai Khan and that smells a lot like it. So that DNA is just kind of in a weird place for me, but I can appreciate it from afar. And then uh, we've got number 48, uh, it's a Jean Patou, and this is a new acquisition to me, and uh, I've worn this to bed multiple times. I have not given this a full wear yet either, but I think uh, I understand this fragrance enough since I, I got it and I loved it instantly when I wore it to bed, and I wore it to bed a couple times, so I have a little better understanding of this, uh, and this is called... Sublime Eau de Toilette, uh, Jean Patou Sublime Eau de Toilette. This fragrance is amazing. This is an amazing creation, and this is the most recent one, SA Designer Parfums Limited. This is not a vintage bottle, and uh, my goodness, I mean, what a chifra fragrance. This is a floral chifra. Actually, you know, thinking about it, this is uh, this chifra extraordinaire by Roja is like two grand, right? I paid like $35 for this, uh, new, sealed, on Mercari. 
And uh, if if you ask me, I would just say buy this. I mean, this is a better floral chiffre than I think Roja's chiffre extraordinaire is. Uh, and Jean Carlio made this in 1992, and it's gorgeous, beautifully gorgeous. Um, it's a little bit powdery from the orris. The florals really come through, but the base has that civet, which is a little bit more turned up, I think, than Chiffre Extraordinaire. I mean, who knows? This could have been like the benchmark that Chiffre Extraordinaire used, because you know Roja always like uses famous fragrances from the past as springboards, if you don't want to just call it an out and out and out and out clone. But this is gorgeous perfumery. Jean Carlio is one of the best of all time. And then, next on the list, uh, number 47, we are going to a, a Rogue perfumery, the House of Rogue. And apparently, the whole idea with the House of Rogue, if you haven't heard of it, is that he is a Rogue perfumer. He doesn't listen to Ifra. He doesn't follow their guidelines. He does whatever he wants kind of thing, right? Uh, and now he's Ifra compliant. So the story doesn't really make sense anymore. And so he kind of changed the bottles the caps of the bottles to look like clear plastic, like these old Roja bottles look like. So his caps now basically look like this, this clear bottle. The old caps look like this. So when he was um, still non ifra compliant, this is what his caps look like. So the newer ones kind of look like this. So I've heard rumors that the new stuff is, um, reformulated that it doesn't smell as good as the old stuff that now that he's trying to be ifra compliant it's lost that magic that it had so if you can find these older bottles apparently that's what you want i've never done a side by side but that's the rumor that i hear from people i trust so this is dervish at number 47 and um this is a very challenging fragrance for me because it starts out very sweet lots of sweet um saffron the saffron note in here is huge at the beginning and it's very sweet and um there is tobacco which comes later on so after the first hour or two this fragrance really settles down beautifully it's a beautiful fragrance underneath but man that first hour or two is really tough for me it's but the oriental resins there's frankincense leather and of course civet beautiful civet in the base with that tobacco note and I just love that tobacco note it's beautiful uh, but for the cold and this is an absolute monster this thing will last on your skin for like 20 hours it's a beast all right number 46 we're going to the house of Latizan Parfumer and this is called Al Oud so this is a Bertrand du Chafford and if you like Bertrand du Chafford's work go try to find a bottle of this because it is discontinued but apparently it did not sell very well. And so you can still find these older bottles. Like this 100 mil, I think you can still get for 80 or 90 bucks. That is a steal for this fragrance, for this quality of fragrance. Now, uh, it did come out in 2009. So it's one of the earlier Oud fragrances. It only came out a couple years after Tom Ford's Oud Wood. Uh, but Bertrand du Chafford has his fingerprints all over this. There's dates and cumin and pink pepper and iris and saffron and oud and rose and a base of resinous myrrh, patchouli, sandalwood, tonka, cedar, and civet. And it's so beautiful. Um, but it is challenging because that cumin, that spicy cumin really jumps out and grabs you. Uh, and so you have to like the note of cumin. But uh, that civet in the dry down with the animalic cumin in the top makes the whole wear just Bertrand du Chafford through and through. And I just, I think people just didn't understand it. So that is Al Oud at number 46. Number 45, we're going back to Roja. And uh, this is a fragrance I have a full review on. If you're interested in learning more about it, you can go check that out. Uh, it's called Majestic Oud Parfum. And this is unfortunately discontinued, although it wasn't that amazing of an oud fragrance, but it is a pretty amazing fragrance if you take the fact that it was supposed to be an oud fragrance out of your head and just appreciate the lovely osmanthus and may rose and cypriol and all these other things in, in the fragrance, ambrette, ambergris. There is castorium in here, so it did make the castorium list and civet. So it made both. So there's now it's making the civet list. But go check out my video. 
I like it, but once this is done, I will not be hunting for a bottle. You know, I'm just gonna leave, let sleeping dogs lie on this one and say I'm just lucky to have experienced it. All right, next we're going to the house of Burberry, believe it or not, and this is number 44. This is called Burberry's for Men from 1981. And this is thanks to Anuj. And this is one I'm trusting my nose on because I don't think there's a civet note listed. There's lavender, there's thyme, there's cardamom, there's chamomile, but there's no civet. But it really feels like there's some, uh, there's some civet and maybe some other florals that are not listed in here. Um, but I really like this fragrance. It's very 80s. I would love to have an original bottle with the uh, sprayer off-centered to the to the right or left, whichever um, I forget. I think it was off-centered to the uh, right if you're holding it, uh, and the wording is facing outwards. But uh, it's a it's a probably one of the best Burberries I've ever smelled. But it's very rare. And when you find it, of course, the seller kind of knows what they have and they want an arm and a leg. So I'm just trusting my nose there. I think there's civet. It definitely feels like there's civet. So I'm putting it at 44. 43. Uh, 43 is a perfume that deserves more hype and love. And if you're one of these people that are like, oh, you know, you have to have a ton of money to participate in the fragrance game. And, you know, if you want to be a collector, you've got to drop big dollars and all this. This is a fragrance that refutes that fact uh, because you can still find bottles of this stuff for 40 bucks. Actually, I got two bottles of this, 200 mil full bottles, one EDP, one EDT for $80 shipped about a year and a half ago. Uh, maybe two years ago now, I can't remember, but um, it is Crazy Crizia. And Crazy Crizia is a Dominique Ropion, and it came out in, uh, so we are at uh, Crazy Crizia, number 43. So it's a Dominique Ropion, it came out in the early 90s, 91, and it has this beautiful galbanum peachy opening with this almost like Calvin Klein obsession like dry down, which that's coming very soon. Um, the civet and vanilla and that ambery base is so beautiful, but value for money on this stuff is through the roof, especially if you like that type of perfume. So it's almost like taking the greenness of Must de Cartier and mixing it with the oriental, you know, um, powdery labdanum vanilla dry down. Beautiful. And the civet has that late 80s, early 90s, you know, animalic oriental vibe. It's just a stunner. Shocking that uh, it's so cheap still. Okay, next on the list, we have a Bortnikoff, and it's number 42. And did I bring the Bortnikoffs? Ah, yes, I did. Okay, so I was like, wait a minute. Uh, number 42, the Bortnikoff we are going to begin with is Oud Monarch. And uh, Oud Monarch is here and not any higher because it really focuses on this chocolatey aspect of the Oud. And it's very floral in the opening. Many people discount how floral this perfume is. There's lots of frangipani and magnolia in the opening. There's lots of rose, different types of rose, Himalayan rose, May rose, uh, and beautiful cinnamon and tobacco. And then it dries to that you know, chocolatey Thai oud with beautiful cacao and civet. And there's also castorium, uh, and, but they, neither note kind of plays a big role. They both play off of each other just to add a little bit of texture, but it's beautiful. Uh, one of my favorite chocolatey ro uh, oud fragrances. Okay, and then we've got number 41, and this is the House of Papillon. I'm gonna have a video on this coming very soon. Uh, and it's called Papillon's Dryad. And I've talked about this fragrance before, but uh, it showed up on some lists. It deserves it because um, I have a feeling that this is going to be an amazing review I do on it. it, it um, from the time I wore it to bed, it has this uh, Val de Nuit, um, number 19, you know, Galbanum, Chanel number 19, Galbanum, but it's like more. It's like this niche version of it. It's got castorium, civet, all these balsams and resins and fruits and citruses and it, it, just stunning, you know, spices, 
green chifra, proper old school green chifra from 40, 50 years ago. Uh, and, you know, Liz Moore is just, everything she does is quality. So that has both castorium and civet. Okay, next is going to be number 40. And here we have uh, Calvin Klein's Obsession. Fragrance, this is the original for women. You don't hear me talk about this very much because I think this has lost some of the top notes. Um, when you first spray for the first five minutes, it almost feels like the fragrance has turned a little bit. Um, but then if you can put up with the first five, ten minutes, it really dries into something beautiful. But Obsession, um, you know, has a little bit more, I feel like, of the animalic civet in the base than Crazy Caritia. But Crazy Caritia... I think is actually a better fragrance. Now, my obsession, like I said, is a little off on the top, so I'd love to smell a pristine bottle, but um, I prefer Crazy Critzia, personally. Uh, I think Dominique Ropion did a better job, but I think that the Civet in Obsession for Women is just a little bit more animalic. Okay, uh, next is another fragrance that you will be seeing a full review on very soon and oh, I forgot to grab it. I don't even know if I'll be able to find it this fast at this point, but let's see. Maybe I will. Um, probably not. So you're just gonna have to take my word for it because it's just a little sample anyways. But um, Rachel sent me a sample and yeah, I won't be able to find it. It's who knows where, it could be anywhere. But it's called uh, Sharer 2, S-C-H-E-R-R-E-R. -R -R -E -R. Uh, Sharer 2 at number 39, and I have sprayed it. I've had a chance to wear it to bed, uh, and I will be doing a video on it very soon. It is actually recommended to me by um, Russian Adam. On one of our streams, he talked about it. That has a beautiful resinous civet um, castorium dry down with this uh, floral spicy thing going on in the heart. Uh, and it supposedly has real Mysore sandalwood from the 80s, too. So what a value for money Sharer 2 worked out to be. I don't know who the perfumer is. I think Russian Adam said it was um, Francois Caron, the uh, ex-wife of the great Pierre Bourdon. But uh, I don't know if that's true or not. I, there's no perfumer listed on uh, Parfuma, which is what I go off of. Okay, next we are going to go to a Lagerfeld at number 38. And this is a stunning fragrance for the winter. It's uh, KL Om. I love this juice. This is a little 60 ml bottle that I found, thank God. Uh, lots of similarities to the original Lagerfeld Cologne. Uh, it has this beautiful orangey vibe to it with rosewood and that 80s, you know, spicy oriental. Think Obsession, think Crazy Caritia. This is in that realm but they've added this benzoin, uh, civet, am ambery vanilla dry down, and it's just so classy. I think this is so classy. I think it's the epitome of this, you know, classy oriental, and um, the women's version is actually even better, I found. We'll talk about that one in just a second. Okay, number 37 is going to be a, a fragrance that I actually have a review on the channel already. You can go check it out. It's from the great greatly underrated house of Jill Sander, and it's called Woman 2. So this was sent to me by Duncan. Thank you, Duncan. I would love a bottle of this stuff. It is so good. Um, and no one talks about it is the thing. I mean, I know there's a million old fragrances out there, and when you're a vintage hunter, I mean, you really have to hunt according to your taste, but God, this is like an animalic floral of the highest quality. I mean... It is so good. Um, so, so good. I mean, the florals in here are spot on. Even though I'm not the biggest fan of tuberose, it's done to perfection. There's little fruity touches, uh, but it's that animalic castorium and civet with the patchouli and the frankincense and real oak moss in the base that just sets this apart. So full bottle worthy. Go check out my review. I love the way Jill Sanders did things in the 80s and early 90s. What a house they were. Uh, the people who know, know about old Jill Sanders. Okay, so this one uh, is probably one of the reasons why I am not frantically hunting a bottle of Francois Coty's original Chifra, 
because uh, this is, uh, according to the person who sent me the sample, very, very close to the original Shifra. Uh, but it does have its own touches, of course. It's Rogue's Shifra Siam. And I have a backup, bigger bottle of this. This is a little 30 mil. I have a 60 mil, I think, in reserve. But, uh, oh God, this is so good. If I mean, look what real oak moss does to, to the color of that juice. Um, real oak moss in, in here back when he was really a rogue. Uh, and it's a floral chiffre as well. But it uses this very interesting note of kefir lime in the top with jasmine absolute, green basil, ylang, oak moss absolute, sandalwood. You can really tell the oak moss in here. Uh, benzoin, leather, civet, and spices. And the reason that this isn't any higher, again, if I was ranking my favorite fragrances, this would definitely be higher on the list, but um, the civet is just so beautifully blended. I mean, you know, nothing stands out. I mean, this feels like it's done. It doesn't feel like it's done by a chef who's just trying his hand at perfume. It feels like it's done by a master perfumer. I love that stuff. Absolutely love it. And I love Rogue's old work. And I'm very sad if it's true that they uh, have, you know, gone downhill on their new releases. Okay, next we're going to talk about the women's version of the Lagerfeld. So coming in at number 35... Uh, this is Lagerfeld KL for women, just the original. And this one bottle of the year, the year that it came out, I think it was 82. Uh, but look at this stunning bottle, almost like the sunrise uh, right here. Or maybe a woman's headdress. I don't know exactly what that was supposed to represent, but I know that uh, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous bottle. The pure parfums, I think this was not plastic like this is now. Um, but yes, K. KL in Pure Parfum, this right here is almost like the bottle itself. So the whole piece of glass looks like this top is what it is. I think that's the one that won Bottle of the Year. But um, same same fragrance, but the Pure Parfum version. So this is a also this spicy oriental. Uh, it's got pimento and spices and real ambergris uh, and frankincense, vanilla, styrax, that resinous, waxy papery styrax with patchouli and sandalwood and I'm really thinking I've uh I've worn this to bed I haven't given this a full wear yet but I've worn it to bed and I I think I know it well enough to know that already that I think this could be even better than the men's version maybe one day I'll even do a, a comparison but they're both going to get full reviewed uh at some point soon but uh, KL beats out the men's version for the amount of civet in the base I think okay Next, we're going to go to number 34, and it is a Givenchy. It's a Givenchy I've talked about on the channel now a lot, and it's called Isaitis de Givenchy. This is the vintage, the short ingredient list. I hear the new stuff has lost a step, but I've never actually smelled it myself. But uh, this is a uh, creation by the great Dominique Ropion. I mean, if you're willing to pay $1,500 for the night, you should be willing to pay $150 for a vintage bottle of this. This is so good. Another floral chiffre, so complex. Civet is so important to a complex floral chiffre base. Uh, this made my Narcissus video, which is daffodil. Uh, there's beautiful honey and high class iris in here. Egyptian rose, everything. It feels like you're at a like a banquet, like a celebration of life. This is a celebration of life fragrance. Just stunning. Okay, next we're going to... Um, Roja Dove again at number 33, and this is going to be uh, Parfum de la Nuit number one. So if I had to get one more Roja, and I don't have to, but if I had to, this is probably the one that I would get. Um, PDLN number one, uh, and I will be doing a full review on this, but it's this um, resinous, spicy, saffron, cystus labdanum, lots of labdanum. Roja loves labdanum, and so do I with that Cipriol that I've come to really love, and um, Styrax and Benzoin, Gaiac Wood and Vetiver and Patchouli and Civet. And the resinous, spicy, animalic Civet dry down is what's really been kind of getting me lately. I've worn this to bed recently. I need to do a full wear on this again and kind of talk about it, but uh, and decide if I really do want to pull the trigger on a full bottle. Maybe if I get a 
good enough deal like I did on PDLN3. I mean, I had a friend reach out and say, hey, I'm selling this. I'll give you a great price. And I just couldn't say no. Maybe if something like that happens or a partial, but um, I don't think I'd give Roja 1400 bucks for that. I can tell you that. Okay, next we're going to a vintage from 1982. And number 32 is Aragon's Porom. Now this is a clone or a copy of um, one of the greatest fragrances of all time from the early 80s, which is coming up later on the list. It's actually at the very top of the list. So uh, if you know what it is, if you know my taste, you know what's going to be on the top of the Civet list. Uh, but this is a clone of that fragrance by Pierre Bourdon. Uh, and or it was in, heavily inspired by it, let's say. But it feels like there's many other things in here. It feels like there's little touches of denim, original denim, which came out in the 70s. Uh, it feels like there's touches of Givenchy Gentleman, which came out in the 70s because there's this castorium, leathery, dry down going on. And there's Civet. Uh, and so this really feels like a blend of many different types of fragrances. I think that's what Manly Sense said in his review on Parfumo, and I agree with him. I see what I absolutely see what he's saying uh, because it does feel like a mixture of many vintage perfumes, but it's overlooked because it's a cheapy, but it's really good. Um, this is one that I need to wear and talk about very soon. Okay, next on the list we're going to number thirty-one, and number thirty-one is a fragrance that I did a review on already, full review, you can go check it out. Uh, it's Ensar Oud, and this is Ensar Oud number two. I think Eddie sent me this. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, I can't remember. I know a couple people have sent me this, but uh, or sent me these types of samples, I believe. Oh, this is, you know, something I really struggled with. Smelling it from the atomizer right now, it smells absolutely beautiful. If you go watch my video, I kind of struggled with it the first, and I, I wore it for a full day. Gave it a full wear. Um, smelling from the atomizer right now, it smells absolutely stunning. But it was challenging. It did remind me a little bit in the opening of uh, Russian Adam, so Arige Le Doré's uh, Oud Picante, which was very challenging to me. One of my least favorite um, Russian Adam creations, but I really did appreciate uh, the, you know, um, the artistic side of that, taking a chance, doing something different. So that's one that I think if I wore it, I'd really come to appreciate it because there's lots of musk, lots of sandalwood, oud, Mysore sandalwood even, and civet in there, and real Siberian musk. So I think I could come to appreciate that, but that very heavy cumin, almost like turmeric open, that's what it feels like. It feels like turmeric, and that heavy spiciness kind of puts me off. Okay, uh, next we are going to number... 30. And number 30 is a Serge Luton's, and it is a fragrance we talked about earlier in the channel, uh, and now it's making its appearance. It is the Great Musk's Kublai Khan. Uh, in the bell jar, the vintage Palais Royale, and um, I've got a 10 ml decant that I created off of this bottle stashed away. And I'll tell you what, this fragrance really challenges me. It really does. I need to just fight my demons and wear it and talk about it soon, but uh, God, when I wear this, I'm just like, oh, it just, it takes me back to, you know, a different time in my life, and um, I just have this strange personal association with it, but the animalics in that are huge. There's castorium and civet with beeswax and costus root, ambergris, of course, musk, ambrette, all this other stuff, patchouli, so I need to revisit it, but uh, it... Um, it's, it's, it's a weird one for me personally. Okay, next on the list, number 29 is Paco Rabanne's La Nuit. Now, this is one of these 80s fragrances for women that I love. There's a handful. There's more coming up here, uh, and I'll point those out. But if you like um, those 80s chifras for women, uh, this is just absolutely stunning. It's another floral chifra with uh, myrtle, artemisia, cardamom. So pretty interesting masculine opening, actually. And then it comes with the jasmine, rose, and peach. So it turns a little bit feminine in the heart, but it also has pepper. And then it dries to oak moss, leather, patchouli, cedarwood, and civet. Almost like a masculine fragrance nowadays. But it's so good. I absolutely love this stuff. I need to wear this soon. Um, 
but uh, Paco Rabanne's La Nuit is going in either one, EDT or EDP. Don't worry, they're both fantastic. I have them both. All right, number 28 is a Russian Adam creation. It's an Arige Ladore, and it is Civet de Nuit. So Civet is actually in the name. I struggled with where to put this because this is not a civet that you would expect, okay? This is this smells nothing like the synthetic civet that you're thinking. This is uh, a civet that they actually were able to use a very special discontinued civet from the 1960s, like a vintage civet. Uh, and go check it out. They blended it with heliotrope and jasmine, and it really reminds me a bit of wearing like a vintage Guerlain in a Riz Ladore style. And he actually had uh, Sultan Pasha help him create this. And so uh, I really liked this fragrance. And, um, you know, if it wasn't 400 bucks, I'd probably own a bottle. But uh, Civet de Nuit is, uh, is a very good fragrance. Okay, next on the list. Next on the list, we are going to another Roja. And uh, so this is number 27 on the list. Yes, 27. And it is the big boy, the big boy Roja. Uh, and the big boy Roja is the actual Roja Houtlux, uh, the, the, his $3,500 a bottle shit uh, that, you know, has really grown on me. And, you know, yes, it has gold flakes in there, which is kind of tacky, but uh, the, the smell has grown on me. This has really grown on me. The uh, first couple times I wore it, I thought, $3,500 for this? What the hell? Uh, and then I wore it more and I thought, okay, it's decent. I made a full video on it. And, um, but now that I actually have a full bottle and I got a great deal on this, again, thanks to a friend, that's why it's great to make, you know, connections in the industry. Um, and uh, this is... Uh, go watch my full review. I think I did it justice, but it's lots of beautiful flowers, big ylang lang in this perfume. You know, if you're hunting for like the perfect ylang lang scent, I, I haven't smelled much better than, than this, but then it dries to this resinous chifra shapeshifter with lots of ambergris, lots of oak moss, uh, and civet, and that resinous labdanum. This is probably one of my best uh, favorite examples of a labdanum fragrance, you know, maybe only behind something like um, the Zoo's Everlasting or maybe just behind, you know, something like Chanel's Le Lyon is probably one step above this as far as labdanum goes. But man, this is really good, really grew on me. And um, I now like crave that, you know what I mean? Like I yearn to wear it. So interesting stuff. Okay. Next is going to be a fragrance from Ungaro, and this is called Diva. Now, this is the vintage Eau de Parfum uh, before, so you can see it says Parfums Ungaro underneath. The newer ones, I think, say Salvatore Ferragamo or something, and now this is completely discontinued anyways, but I will do a video on this very soon. This is a creation by the great Jacques Polge. And so uh, Ungaro outsourced all of their perfume making to Chanel in the 80s and in early 90s, early to mid 90s. And so all of the fragrances you'll see have the names of Jacques Polge and Francois de Machy on them because they made them. Um, but this is almost like a precursor to the next fragrance. So this is coming in at number 26, uh, Ungaro Diva. And then number 25, is Chanel's Coco. Uh, the uh, very next year, Jacques Poles created this for Chanel. And Diva was like, I think, a test run. So there was Diva, and this is a vintage bottle. You can see the shorter ingredient list. I don't know exactly when this is from, but there is a very old Macy sticker on there. $45 they sold this for back in the day. Interesting. Uh, and this is another one that deserves uh, not just need, but des really deserves to be talked about. Uh, this is fantastic stuff. This is, um, do not let the fact this is for a woman put you off at all. It's a beautiful spicy oriental fragrance with um, uh, beautiful cinnamon. It's, it's so good. I mean, 
this would make a hot, this would make a great Christmas scent or, you know, Thanksgiving scent or, you know, again, celebratory scent. Lots of honey in the base and amber and civet and, um, yeah, I need to wear that and talk about it more. All right, next on the list, we have a uh, Aramis fragrance. So at number 24, we've got the Great Aramis 900 from the 70s. This is from 1973, and the Great Bernard Champ made this. Got a perfumer's portfolio video coming on him very soon. And uh, this is rosewood, bergamot, coriander. I love coriander in, in fragrances with orris, geranium, carnation, that old school carnation rose. This is a fantastic rose. One of my favorite roses. Look at the red. That red just signals rose to me. Um, and it's got a ton of civet. This is actually a very challenging, this can be a very challenging fragrance for a newer nose. I think if um, you, you don't have some type of experience with fragrances, I don't think your age matters with this one, because uh, I think this would smell amazing on a 20-year-old. I think it would smell amazing on an 80-year-old, but I think you do have to have some level of experience to wear this, okay? So, Aramis 900. Uh, apparently, the new bottles are good. I would say if you want the animalic you know, big oak moss civet in the base, uh, go for these older bottles, but, um, you know, apparently the new stuff is still good. Okay, next. Next on the list, we've got a Dior. And number 23, we have a Dior. And uh, it's one, I wish I had an older bottle of this, but you know what? I'm happy with this. I know that... Um, the older bottles are probably better where the C and the D are not connected, but I think this is really good. Leather Oud. Uh, and Leather Oud is, um, I mean, for a Francois de Machy creation, I really have to kind of tip my hat to him here. There's um, lots of like this birchy, leathery, you know, beeswax, labdanum, resinous feel with oud and civet. And, um, you know, the civet and the oud play off of each other to create a pretty challenging fragrance for maybe a, a, an, a nose that's first getting out of the designers and into something more complex. But I absolutely love this stuff. Can't wait to wear it. Need to wear it soon. Um, and so this is kind of one of those I just have to say, you know what, screw everything else, I'm wearing this, and it deserves it. So it's coming in at number 23. Number 22. Uh, number 22 is going to be a L'Envon fragrance, and this is a vintage bottle of My Sin. I've talked about this before. It deserves to be talked about more. Apparently, they launched it as a different fragrance originally. This is all the way back in the 1920s, 1924. And it flopped. And they changed the name. So what they did is they changed the name to My Sin. Risque, you know, for a fragrance from the 20s. Sinning? And you should have seen the advertisement. The advertisement was insane. Uh, look up old advertisements of L'Enval My Sin and you'll be like, wow. I mean, crazy stuff, right? And um, very rips. Talk about risque advertising. That was very risque. And it worked. It sold like a mother. Uh, discontinued now. But it's basically a animalic floral, beautiful animalic floral uh, with, you know, very high class neroli, bergamot, aldehydes in the top, beautiful floral, spicy, orris with this woody, musky, resinous civet and vetiver in the dry down. I think it's very masculine. I don't think it's feminine. Uh, I, I mean, obviously a woman can wear it, a man can wear it. Uh, and, but as far as like modern feminine to masculine scale goes, many of these old feminine fragrances are more masculine than modern masculines, you know? So yes, my sin is one to target. And then we've got a Guerlain. Number 21, we have a Guerlain, one of the greatest or uh, first fragrances, first modern perfume fragrances of, uh, of all time, basically. And it's Jiki. This is credited with being like the father of modern perfumes. Uh, it is this uh, hesperitic, fresh, uh, fougere, 
with, you know, herbal rosemary and lavender. Uh, there's also vetiver in here with leather, frankincense, rosewood, ambergris, civet. But uh, it's just stunning. Even the modern. I sent uh, the modern. And again, Eau de Parfum, Eau de Toilette. I think I prefer this one a little bit more than the Eau de Parfum that I have. But I sent Russian Adam a bottle of the, or a um, sample of the Eau de Parfum from like, I don't know, not long ago, seven or eight years ago. And he's like, wow, the dry down just turns to like civet in the dry down. I was like, I know, it's crazy. But I, I do really enjoy Jiki still. Okay, next on the list at number 20, we have a amazing fragrance. I wish I could afford a full bottle. Well, I can't afford it. I just don't want to spend the money. Uh, it is a Ensar Oud at number 20, and it's called Tiger Lust. I am in love with this stuff. This stuff is magical. Um, it is floral, it's like frangipani, civet, castorium with fruity blackcurrant in like four types of oud with osmanthus and tobacco. Osmanthus is one of my new loves, by the way. Go watch my This Is Not A Top 10 Osmanthus video. Next on the list, we have the great Robert uh, Piguet. And this is Bandi, Eau de Toilette, vintage Eau de Toilette. Look what they used to do in the old days. They would like, these old bottles, I've seen this before with that white writing. It's very strange, but number 19 is Bandi. Uh, and I mean, this is, this also has castorium in it. So it's kind of hard to separate the two. God. One of the best leathers of all time. So butch. I can't believe this was marketed for women. I just still to this day, like short circuits my brain. My brain's like just short circuit. That's it. I can't believe it that this was marketed for, for women. Um, galbanum and tarragon and carnation and rose oak moss and castorium and civet and myrrh and leather. And you know what? I think that this was an inspiration for Roja's Diaghilev. I think, yes, there's a little bit of Mitsuko, and I think there's a little bit of Roja's Femme, but I think he took inspiration from the great Bandi, and I think he took inspiration from Estee Lauder Azure. That's my opinion. Uh, okay, next we're going to go to another Guerlain, and this one ranked a little higher than Jiki for me because I enjoy wearing it a little bit more, and this is number 18. It is Mouchoir de Monsieur. Now, this is basically discontinued outside of just going to Paris and buying it from the one place they still sell it. Uh, and there's no civet note listed in Parfumo for this fragrance. So again, I'm using my nose. There's civet in here. I mean, uh, the fact that it's not listed is just an oversight I, by them, I assume. There's definitely civet. This animalic dry down comes through pretty strong. It's not just vanilla, amber, oak moss, and iris like they list. There is definitely this civet pissy, animalic type vibe, but uh, it's very close to Jiki. Uh, but this was in 1904. Jiki was like 80, 18, 89 or something. Uh, and then they created this for uh, for men because men were wearing Jiki back then. And this is a, um, this is just a, just an amazing fougere. Just absolutely stunning with the uh, lavender, tonka, just beautiful. Uh, shame it's discontinued. Okay, next is going to be number 17. And number 17 is an Ungaro. It is one of those Ungaros that uh, Demachi and Jacques Poles worked on. It came out in 92, and it's Ungaro Porlome 2. Now, if you like that classic DNA, like think Chanel's Pour Monsieur, or uh, think um, Tiffany for Men, something like that, this takes that style, because... They also did Tiffany for Men, by the way. So it takes that Tiffany Men DNA that they released a couple years earlier and it beefs it up with a little bit more leather and patchouli and stuff like that in the base. But it also adds this civet. And this huge civet comes out in the base of this. Um, when you first spray, you might think I'm a little bit crazy ranking it this high. But when you wear it and once you get to the base and like especially when your skin heats up, like I would go run in the evenings, and this thing would just explode off of my skin, just civet galore in the dry down. 
um, but it is in the dry down, so you have to be patient, but I'm telling you, there's a beautiful civet note in the base of this. And then we're gonna go back to another Russian Atom creation. I'm sorry, we are not gonna go back to a Russian Atom yet. We are going to go to a, um, we are going to go to a creation from Ducita. And this is called Oud Infini at number 16. So number 16 is Oud Infini, and it is um, the best Ducita out there. Yes, it does focus on the rose, as you can see, but it also focuses on Oud and, and Civet. And look at, look at the color of that juice. I just love this stuff. I need to wear it again soon. Uh, uh, wish I had a full bottle of this one. It's probably the only Ducita I want a full bottle of, but uh, I'm happy with this little decant. It's I'm taking good care of it. Um, excuse me. And there's also this, apparently they claim my source sandalwood. I don't know if it's true or not, but my source sandalwood and benzoin and, and bourbon vanilla absolute and musk with the oud. Okay, next we are going to a um, Bortnikov, number 15, and this one's called Oud Maximus. Uh, so, Oud Maximus uh, is one of my favorite out-and-out -out Oud perfumes, and um, this is the 2020 version. I have never smelled the 2018 or 19 versions, but you don't have to worry about versions because this is amazing. Oh, I mean, just a fantastic oud creation. There's tons of, um, in oud maximus, there's tons of um, castorium. I think there's both. Uh, let me see if there's both. Oud Maximus 2020, uh, yes, so there is Real Deer Musk, Civet, there is no Castorium though, I thought there was both, it's just basically there's four types of Oud in here, with Birch Tar, Vanilla, Tolu Balsam, multiple types of Rose, it's just so beautiful, uh, and then the Civet in the base just sets everything off, Oud Maximus 2020, one of my favorite out and out oud creations. Just a just a full on oud. You know, that barnyard oud. If you like that barnyard oud, it's amazing. Uh, and then we're going to go to number 14, and it's a Russian Atom creation. So Russian Atom just beats out Oud Maximus by one place, which by the way, Russian Atom and Dmitry Bortnikov have a collaboration coming together very soon. Cannot wait for that. Uh, but this one's called Oud Zen. So Oud Zen beats it out because of the fact, and I have a full video on this, you can check it out, but there is Castorium and Civet in the base of this with Saffron. And so there's two types of Oud, Oud and Indian Oud here, um, but the Castorium and the Civet, I feel like play a little bigger role here, whereas there's four types of Oud in Oud Maximus, and uh, I feel like maybe the four types of Oud play a little bigger role there. But uh, this is beautiful. This is absolutely stunning. And I love the animalic dry down of this. This is 100% this is full bottle worthy. Actually, I tried to buy a bottle of this and um, someone beat me to it. So I found a bottle, I was gonna buy it, someone beat me to it. Which I was kind of pissed off about, but I'll find, I'll find a bottle eventually. Okay, on to an amouage. And I have an amouage coming, by the way, so I have an unboxing soon. But uh, this is also full bottle worthy, but can't buy everything, uh, even though I try. This is uh, Opus 9 by the great Nathalie Lorsen in Pierre Negrin. And um, get out of there. The only bad thing about these is that they uh, don't come out easy. Okay, so there you go. Opus 9. Oh. It's just uh, one of the best animalic florals I've ever smelled. There's bunches of leather and beeswax and civet. And the civet and, and ambergris in the base are so prominent. God, it's it's amazing. Um, full bottle worthy, but uh, I just, I don't know if I want to pay the prices for it. 
If Amouage would just hurry up and send me free bottles like they promised. No, I'm just kidding. They didn't promise me, but um, they do send a lot of free bottles out all of a sudden, so maybe I can get on that list somehow. I guess I gotta say nothing but good things about them, which I'll never do, so I guess I'll never be on the list. But um, I do have an Amouage I purchased with my own money coming very soon, so you can see I still do like the house from time to time, but I don't like the direction they're going. Number 12 uh, is one of the most iconic fragrances of all time. Uh, Roja actually highlighted this on the fifth floor of Herod's as one of the most important uh, fragrances as far as fragrance history goes. This is Bala Versailles. So Bala Versailles opens up like this. And I did a full review on Bala Versailles. You can check that out. But how about that flacon? And you want to see what real civet does. This is a vintage. This is pure parfum. Uh, Jean, Jean de Prez is the house. And you want to see what real civet does? Look at the uh, stopper. Let me show you something. Look at the stain on the stopper. That is real civet in action right there, my friends. Oh, it is absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, I saw a bottle of this on eBay for a thousand dollars. This exact one, actually. Uh, don't pay a thousand dollars for it, obviously. But if you can get it for a respectable price, like I did, I think I paid like 80 bucks for that. Go for it. Okay, next, uh, we are going to go to a fragrance that I am looking for a bottle and thinking about buying a bottle constantly. I just haven't pulled the trigger yet. It's so good. I did a full review. Uh, you can go check it out. It's called Monsieur Lavon. This is from the 60s. And the civet here is one of the best, honestly. It's this green, spicy, you know, um, geranium, castorium, sage. You know, you've got this like spicy herbal thing going on. But it dries to the cinnamony, labdanum, myrrh, leather, and big civet in the base. Huge. I mean, enormous. Uh, it's discontinued, of course, but from the 1960s. And, um, you know, I've got enough juice to wear this again as my scent of the day. So I need to, I need to wear this again because I absolutely love this stuff. Full bottle worthy. Okay, number 10 top 10. And this is a fragrance that I actually don't like, would not buy, but I'd have a video up on my channel. You can find it. It's from the house of, um, oh, what's this guy's name? Jeffrey Dame. And it's called Just Filthy. And the reason that this had to be here, even though I don't like it, is it's a Koros clone. To me, it is. It's a take on Koros, if you will. Lots of civet. Scatol, which if you don't know what scatol is, look it up. Uh, I don't want to explain it here, but uh, look it up. And um, so there's scatol and tons of civet and cumin and it's, yeah. I, um, I really don't like this one. Really don't like Just Filthy. I'd much rather wear the King Koros. We'll get to that one at the very top of the list. But this had to be in the top 10 just because I'm trying to rank them objectively. And so this had to be there just objectively. Even though if I was going off of my favorite fragrances, that would be at the bottom. Okay, next we are going to uh, one of the greatest fragrances of all time. And that is Joy Parfum by the house of Jean Petou. Joy Parfum is uh, one of the greatest floral animalic scents of all time. And it has this um, animalic dry down with civet that just is stunning. For any, any perfume fan should smell this once in their life. You know, it should be one of those bucket list items, one of those all-time greats, kind of like Apre Londe for me was for me yesterday when I did that early impression. And uh, it is just out of this world. Even though it's not my favorite type of fragrance, I highly respect Joy. The Pure Parfum is amazing. So that is number nine. Number eight is uh, this little gem, which um, you guys know I love. It's my favorite Roja. I did a top Roja countdown and this made number one. Obviously it had to. 
People have purchased this based on my recommendation. They've came back and said, yep, amazing Shifra. Uh, and it is Diagolev. And Sivet plays a big, big part in, in Diagolev. Uh, it's this... God. Fuck, I just want to wear it. Every time I smell it. Oh, God, I just want to wear it. I mean, <clears throat> it's such a complex Shifra with cumin and ambergris and all kind of stuff. Lots of labdanum and oak moss. <clears throat> and um, there is this peach vibe that people compare it to Mitsuko. But for me, you know, there's bits and pieces of Rochas Femme. Uh, like I said, there's bits and pieces of Bendy. There's bits and pieces of Azure in here. Um... But yeah, I, I honestly need a backup bottle of that. Okay, number seven. <clears throat> number seven is probably the um, best early impression video I ever did in my life. Go watch it. Uh, and you'll see just how excited I was at, at having this fragrance. Uh, this is called Teatro a la Scala by the house of Crizia. This is the Eau de Toilette. I also have the Eau de Parfum. <clears throat> They're all amazing. It doesn't matter. Get... Whatever you can get, get. Uh, this is one of the best, God. This is literally, to me, one of the best examples of civet in a spicy uh, floral chifra construction out of this world. Um, and if you like cocoa, Tetra Scala came out a year later and I think was heavily inspired by Coco. Uh, and while many people may prefer Coco, <clears throat> you know, Tetra Scala for me is such a revolutionary scent. Like when I smelled this, you know, within the last year, let's say, go watch my video, go find it. I think it was like eight or nine months ago I did it. It was like a just light bulb came on, you know, and I talked about this yesterday when I talked about, um, Apre Londe, you know, when you're asleep and it's dark in the room and someone turns on the light, what do you do? That light is like illumination, right? You, you shield your eyes, you squint, you don't want to see it. You look away, right? Like it's hard for you to accept. This was that light bulb moment for me. Tietra a la Scala was like something I had to get adjusted to, like, uh, not in the sense of the fragrance, because I loved it so much, but in the sense of my thought. The way that I thought about perfume changed because of Tietro Alla Scala. It changed everything for me. Uh, and Thomas from uh, Early Greek Channel actually said that this will knock you for a loop. You know, this will knock you off your stool if you've never smelled it. He's right. Uh, it is amazing, and I uh, cannot wear to, wait to wear that again. The beeswax in there is just amazing. Uh, okay. And then we're going to number six. And this is a fragrance that also was very high on my castorium list. It's uh, Suga's Fiona. Uh, and Fiona is one of the craziest animalic fragrances of all time. If you're an animalic fan, you have to own this fragrance. Um, I've got two of these because I'm so worried something's going to happen to the perfume. And I wanted to back up, but it's civet, multiple types of ambergris, multiple types of uh, animalics like skunk and hyrax, muskrat, multiple types of oud, many different florals. It's so good. And James Berry may not be the best blender. I mean, he's a new kid on the block, but damn, this is good. I mean, uh, one full wearing made me instantly buy a backup of this. And then... Uh, we've got another Russian Atom, very high on the list, very high, um, number five actually. And if you love animalics and if you love musk, <clears throat> you have to try to find a bottle of this. This is uh, War and Peace. War and Peace one or two, it doesn't matter. Get whatever you can find. Um, this is so good. Oh, fuck. The Deer Musk. Civet combo is a knockout banger. Uh, absolute knockout banger. You know, it's uh, animalic, it's leathery, the deer musk, and, and there's castorium absolute. 
to mix with the civet, which gives it this leathery vibe. You know, there's real ambergris, there's oak moss, there's vetiver, there's multiple types of rose, there's amber, there's orris absolute. It is uh, amazing. And if you want to know what inspired Russian Adam to create this, there's a very old Guerlain called Jeddi. Go watch my uh, interviews with him if you haven't. And he talks about what inspired him to create this. And one of them, amazing. All right, next we're going to go to the house of Rocco Barocco. And unfortunately, the name kind of uh, rubbed off. But this is called Joint Poron. Number four, Joint Poron. And the reason this is here is... This is a 90s fragrance that uh, is trying to be an 80s fragrance, okay? It came out in 93, should have came out in 83. It's got this old school green opening, tobacco and rose and honey, and then it dries to the most, one of the most perfect 80s civet I've ever smelled. Uh, and, you know, this is just one of my favorite examples of proper civet in a masculine perfume and i love it i absolutely love it uh and the uh last two are basically the same but there's a number three first and the number three is amouage gold man uh gold man makes it here because of the um way that the civet is used and because of again a change of thought for me you know my wife used to complain this smells like baby powder on me and um, I always got this lush you know uh, instead of a civet I always thought of like a tiger with this fragrance this fragrance is like a tiger you know it's got this lovely frankincense and myrrh combo but then it, it does go powdery because of the jasmine and orris and stuff like that but the dry down with the civet is um, something else. I mean, it's out of this world. It's uh, It really is like liquid gold, dry down. It's beautiful. One of Guy Robert's best. Um, and so, Amouage Gold Man. Uh, gold Man has more civet to me than, than Gold Woman, so that's why it's here. And then, we've got the top two. What do you think they are? You know the top, you probably know number one. What do you think number two is? Um... Well, I'll tell you what number two is. Number two is this. Jacques Bogart Furio. One of the most underrated, animalic, spicy, ambrette. Oh, God. Ambrette and um, lavender with civet and just tenacious. This fragrance is tenacious. Um, you could try to scrub it off. You won't succeed. This fragrance will go on and on and on. And I love this stuff. I think it's amazing. I love the florals in it. Yes, there's carnation, geranium, and jasmine. Um, but more importantly, the oak moss and the civet are just... It is discontinued. No matter what people say, it is discontinued. Um, Jacques Bogart is not making this anymore. So if you find a bottle on the cheap, grab it. Number one. What do you guys think number one is? There can only be one number one. Hands down. The best civet fragrance of all time and let me show you something i decanted some of this for liz moore's of papillon okay i sent her some vintage fragrances to smell and look at what the fragrance did to the lid because when i sprayed it in the decanter it got around the outside this is obviously ysl's koros the greatest one of the greatest masculines of all time top three in my top 100 countdown but look at the look at the lid look at the stain Look at the stain. Look at that. That is a pure, look at the yellow on the atomizer, but look at the stain around the outside where residue shot back from the atomizer where I was trying to decant it for her. That is a pure civet stain, like a piss stain on a Koros bottle. Absolutely amazing. Oh, fuck. I might have to wear this tomorrow. It is so goddamn good. Even from the atomizer, man. Koros is, um, if you don't know Koros, old Koros, um, you know, this is a original, uh, I guess, uh, Charles of the Ritz, but you don't have to go for the original Charles of the Ritz. You could go for uh, Parfums Corp. You could even go for the 
um, Gucci PPR, whatever they called them. Uh, just don't get the one with the white shoulders. That's been neutered. It's Koros with its balls cut off, okay? Get the one with the silver shoulders. You don't have to go for particular ones. Just go for one with silver shoulders. It doesn't matter which one that is. It could be one from eight years ago or 10 years ago. It could be one from 20 or 30 years ago. But if you get a chorus with silver shoulders, you're good. Uh, it is one. It is the best civet fragrance ever created. And I think it's the best Pierre Bourdon fragrance ever created. His father, Pierre Bourdon's hard, you know, jackass of a father who never gave him any love or uh, appreciation or, you know, never gave him any encouragement, wore this. How about that for a mind fuck? Like a father who would basically said, you know, you are not worthy to be a perfumer. And that the reason that, you know, basically turned him into the person that he was, the reason why he was giving all of these, you know, uh, perfume, um, you know, uh, uh, creations over to Olivier Creed is because he couldn't put up with failure because of his old man. His old man constantly called him a failure, according to the book, The Ghost Perfumer. Uh, but, his father wore this as his signature scent. How's that for a, um, how's that for a mind fuck? But it is just, to me, I mean, it's definitely signature scent worthy. This is from a time, this is from a better time to me. The 80s were a better time than they are, than the world we live in now. The world we live in now is shit. Uh, this takes me back to, I wasn't even born in 81 when this came out. But it takes me back to, you know, a memory of a better time in the world. I understand the world is never perfect. I understand that uh, the 80s had their own set of problems, right? But um, if you said, Ramsey, you could go back there right now. You have to give up your cell phone and all the electronics and all the modern stuff that you have that's so great. But you could go back to the 80s and live your life and have your family and enjoy yourselves in the 80s. You wouldn't have the luxuries of today. Uh, would you do it? Hell yes. Absolutely I would. And this is the fragrance that screams 80s to me. This is the instant transportation. I can just close my eyes and I'm there. You know, I'm picking bear I'm picking raspberries in my grandmother's um raspberry bush at five years old, you know, and, and my uncles wore these type of masculine fragrances. It's just uh it's just, um, it's, it's perfection. I mean, it's, it's, it is a perfect masculine fragrance. And even though it, you may say, how can something so challenging and animalic be perfect? That's why it's perfect because it is challenging and it, and it is animalic and it does have balls and it stands up to the boring corporate drones who just want you to be, you know, a cardboard cutout of everyone else. This fragrance says, fuck you. You know, that's why this is number one. And I absolutely love Koros because of it. So, an hour and 37 minutes. I didn't mean for this to be that long, but you know how it goes when I ramble. Thanks for watching. Thank you to everybody who subscribes, likes, comments, all the stuff I never talk about. Thank you. Uh, it is very much appreciated. And um, I hope you guys like this. Tell me what your favorites are. You know, a top 50 countdown with 11 honorable mentions is a bitch, especially when I go into these deep details. So I hope you guys appreciate this and I hope this uh, gives you something, you know, some fragrances to put on your watch list. So cheers, everyone. Thank you, guys. See you again tomorrow. Bye now.